Hey, folks, welcome. Um, please keep getting food and drink. In five minutes or so, we will assemble and begin the program proper, but please keep eating and lubricating. It's good for business.
Hey, folks, two-minute warning. Please get some food, get some drink. We'll begin talking and not just mingling in a few minutes. All right, folks, please find seats. I, I think we should get the show proper underway. Uh, the food and drink are still here. Uh, there will be time after the program for us to continue in, in conversation. Um, I am Bruce Shapiro, executive director of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, a project of Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism where you are. Welcome to the World Room and to the 29th annual DART Awards for Excellence in Coverage of Trauma. It's been an amazing journey over three decades to get here and I, I still kind of can't quite believe it. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping notes and then I'll say just a few things to set this evening up. We have a couple of speakers a bit of ceremony and we'll, then we'll get into the winner's round table, which is the heart of this evening. Um, this is one of my favorite nights of the year because I always learn so much from the astonishing colleagues who we're honoring here. Um, first of all, the housekeeping. Uh, I want to very much acknowledge the Dart Foundation of Mason, Michigan and the Kenneth B. Dart Foundation of Cayman Islands who have been for many years now the key supporters, the anchor funders of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma and of the DART Awards. Uh, indeed, the DART Foundation established this award in 1994 and has remained our continuous funder since. Um, also in the housekeeping department, um, more mundanely, if you need restrooms, <laughs> there is a women's room immediately out the door. There is an all-gender restroom halfway down the hall, and there is a men's room two flights down in the basement. Um, other interesting housekeeping. Um, when we get to Q&A with our wonderful panelists, which will happen in a little while after some conversation, um, you can line up by the mics, and you should know that this entire event is being recorded by the J School and will be, uh, will be made available on the DART Center's uh, webpage and YouTube page in due course. So that means that your questions will be recorded. Just know that. Don't say anything you wouldn't want your grandparents or your children to overhear. Um, and finally, on your seats, you will notice uh, these interesting business cards um, with a little QR code on them. Uh, these um, invite you to join 
the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma Research List. Uh, one of our other projects are a whole host of studies into the experiences of journalists who cover traumatic events, trauma stories, who experience um, occupational health concerns as a result of this work. And this QR code um, simply allows you to put yourself on a list to find out when we're doing new studies that may contribute to the knowledge that we have about best practices in trauma reporting and best practices in newsroom duty of care. Um, so if it interests you, click on the QR code and sign up. Um, again, I, I, I want to welcome you to this particular night. Um, it is always a highlight of the DART Center's year because we get to go into such depth with extraordinary, innovative, ethical, imaginative journalists. Um, tonight, I, I can't help but say that I, I'm going to speak a bit more personally than usual. Um, all of us here tonight um, know that we're here in the shadow of events of war crimes and escalating retaliation unfolding in Israel and Gaza, which has already left, I should say, 10 journalists dead and two missing. And for many of us, probably all of us in this room in one way or another, this is more than just another story. Uh, some of us in this room will have grown up, or, or like my wife, had parents or grandparents who grew up amid colonial occupation, land theft, and the criminalization of national aspiration. Some of us will have, like my own grandparents, fled pogroms and mass murder. Some of us here were in this city when it was attacked 22 years ago, or had lives or families or communities here or far away upended by the wars which followed. Um, the present tense reality of the news Amidst, amidst which we are gathering, um, and these layers of private meaning collide in ways that can be evocative, disturbing, and bewildering. It's easy in the face of that to get trapped into doom scrolling or to feel ourselves tighten into a fist or to shut down entirely and turn away. Um, the reporting that we are here to honor tonight offers us an alternative. Each of the journalists, each of the stories that you're going to meet is an act of refusal. These stories all refuse the siren song of dehumanization, which grants permission to perpetrators of atrocity whether in the intimate sphere of childhood abuse and sexual violence, the shadow economy of human trafficking, or the public stage of war. These stories all refuse to either sensationalize violence or turn away from its reality. These stories all refuse silence and stigma in the lives of trauma survivors, all insist on the visibility, the dignity, and the complicated paths that individuals and families and communities follow in the wake of violence and crisis and tragedy. The DART Awards were established in 1994 with a generous grant from the W.A. and Claire DART Foundation of Mason, Michigan, um, specifically to advance this kind of journalism. The awards today are a flagship program of the DART Center, which is still, sus still sustained by the DART Foundation uh, and the Kenneth B. DART Foundation. The DART Awards honor exceptional, innovative reporting that presents survivors with trauma and dignity, with insight and ethical commitment. And while you'll hear a lot about the stories, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the criteria the process by which they were selected, because it really illuminates 
why we're all gathered here tonight. The, the DART Awards are judged every year by a unique interdisciplinary panel that includes faculty of this school, which includes practicing journalists, past DART Award winners and others, which includes also the president-elect of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. This year, Angela Nickerson of Australia, who can't be here tonight, but is one of the leading um, clinicians and researchers on the trauma landscape today. And they're asked to, and th then there's a host of, of, of first round judges and final judges who sort dozens and dozens of entries. And they're asked to apply some basic criteria, which I would ask you to reflect on as you hear from our journalists this evening and hear about the stories. Um, all DART Award winners need to exhibit the highest standards of journalism excellence. We start there. They portray victims and survivors of trauma with sensitivity and insight. They must inform readers about the ways individuals react to and cope with emotional trauma. They must avoid sensationalism, melodrama, and the portrayal of victims as simply tragic or pathetic. Instead, they should emphasize victims and survivors' experience rather than the traumatic event itself. Those criteria, with some minor modifications, have remained unchanged since 1994. And they represent, in many ways, not just criteria for judging some stories once a year, which is a wonderful carrot. The Dart Center does, we don't do carrots and sticks, we do carrots and carrots approach to encouraging innovative ethical journalism. Um, but, you know, these criteria represent a set of professional and ethical and cultural commitments that we hope will steadily and have steadily improved the face of reporting, encouraged now two generations or more of journalists in profoundly ethical, profoundly compassionate, profoundly hard-hitting, effective recording, uh, reporting, which changes public conversation. You're gonna hear from our winners tonight. You're also gonna hear a little bit about each winning project um, in some wonderful video narrated by someone I also want to acknowledge here, our good friend and one of this year's Dart Award judges, Sasha Pfeiffer, who is in the purple shirt there in the audience, um, the invest senior investigative correspondent and sometimes wonderfully welcome host uh, for NPR's All Things Considered and a key friend and ally of the Dart Center for many years. Um, we're gonna hear now from a couple of people We'll hear from um, Dean Jelani Cobb of this school and a couple of folks from the DART Foundation. And then we'll begin presenting the awards and then kind of get around to the um, round table itself. I, I would also tell you as you listen, those of you who are working journalists, those of you who are students in this school here, to know that the DART Awards are designed to do more than just bring happiness to a team of reporters who worked long and hard on a tough story. Though that's really very good. Uh, we're very happy to do that. They are also designed to provide examples of how it can be done. And in many ways, the most important work that these stories do comes after this award ceremony tonight, after the awards are announced, when we not only publish each winning story on the Dart Center website, but publish tip sheets and interviews and backgrounders and these conversations going under the hood as you all will be doing on the journey we're about to embark on to pass lessons on to other reporters, other editors, other broadcasters in how it really can be done. Um, I am going to turn the mic over for a few minutes now to um, my boss, the Dart Center's boss, um, Dean Jelani Cobb uh, of Columbia Journalism School. Jelani um, is a historian a journalist, uh, the founder, <laughs> the founder of the uh, Lippmann Center for Reporting on Civil and Human Rights, based here at the school, um, and um, he also is someone for whom reporting 
on trauma, telling, telling stories of trauma, is in his own bones, deep, deeply in his own professional DNA. I, I said to some of our friends from the Dart Foundation earlier today that when Jelani became dean two years ago, while we've always had wonderfully supportive relationships with the deans of this school, uh, Jelani is, is the first dean whom I did not have to educate about what the Dart Center does and why it's important. Um, he's understood it in a deep and wonderfully supportive way. Jelani. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I'm happy to be here uh, with you uh, this evening. And um, you know, just before we started, uh, I was talking with Professor Shapiro about uh, the turnout. And he was like, are people going to come? Are people going to come? I was like, it'd be fine. People are going to come. Um, and now we have to actually go get more seating uh, for people. So we're happy to see uh, this level of support uh, for the DART Awards. And you know, I'll, I'll begin by saying that, well, first I want to acknowledge uh, representative from, representatives uh, from the DART Foundations. Uh, because of their generosity, we're able to do uh, the work, the crucial work that we do uh, here uh, at the Journalism School and specifically uh, in the DART Center. Uh, in addition, I want to thank uh, our judges. I don't know how many of you are here. You raise your hands if you are one of the judges. Okay, so um, you see several people here. Uh, I had the experience, my first year uh, here as a faculty member, I had the experience of being a judge uh, for the DART Awards. And what it did was deepen my appreciation for the entries, the work uh, of the journalists who won that year. But more fundamentally, it deepened my appreciation for the work of journalism because every single person whose entry we evaluated had bravely and boldly confronted something difficult and something hard uh, in the service of a really noble ambition that we rarely speak out, speak out loud, which is that we do this work in the hope of no longer doing this work. And all the work that we do is in the interim. Uh, it's an ideal that if we educate people, if we inform people, if we show people what exactly is happening in the world, that we are conscientious enough, it's a faith in our humanity that we are conscientious enough to actually move in the direction of a better way for us to exist. Obviously, we're not here yet. Uh, as you made your way uh, to campus, uh, you likely heard uh, the voices of protest uh, that are in accord with the dynamics that we've seen uh, in the world in the past week and the trauma that has been unleashed in myriad directions uh, that will unfold over years to come. And we will be there to chronicle what has happened now in this moment and the after effects of it in a year, in a decade, until we no longer have to do this work. So I want to say thank you uh, to everyone who has come out. I want to say thank you uh, to everyone from the Boston Globe, the Milwaukee Journey, Journal, Sentinel, ProPublica, the New York Times, Spotify, and the Washington Post, uh, who are here with us this evening. Uh, and in a bigger sense, I want to say thank you to all of us uh, who subscribe to that idealic, idealistic notion that we will do this work until we no longer have to do this work. Thank you. Um, I now want to introduce someone else who's been a critical friend and ally from the Dart Center for the Dart Center since since before the beginning, since the inception of the Dart Awards in 1994. Um, these awards, by the way, existed before there was a Dart Center, so um, we're in, into deep history here. Um, and that's Jim Lammers. Uh, Jim is the 
board chair of Dart Container Corporation, um, but he's here tonight as the president of the board of um, of the Dart Foundation. Jim has been a key ally, friend, and guiding spirit and partner, really, who has been in such accord with the mission and work for the Dart Center all these years. And every year, it's always such a pleasure to introduce him, um, to say a few things. Jim, you're on. Bruce, I want to thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be here this evening. Um, as Bruce was talking, as many of us have probably experienced when you're second, third, or fourth to speak, you start looking at your comments and say, well, he said that, he said that, he said that. <laughs> so at any rate, sometimes it's fine to sound the same themes. Uh, in this case, I think it is because they're, they're important ones. Um, so I do want to begin, Bruce, by thanking you for your long and very steady and effective leadership of the DART Center, and to you, um, Jelani, for your interest in and support of the DART Center. And I also want to thank all the members of the DART Center staff and the many friends of the DART Center who are here tonight and may be listening um, from afar. Um, albeit from a funding perspective, um, I've had the pleasure of being involved from the beginning. And the seeds of the DART Center were planted at Michigan State University. Um, they began to sprout at the University of Washington in Seattle. And since 2009, they have blossomed here at the Columbia School of Journalism, uh, which has been its home. Um, and over the last 30 years, uh, I think the DART Center um, has um, uh, grown its programs, its reach, its impact, and is very rightfully recognized as the leader in the journalism and trauma space. And as, it, as was announced earlier this fall, the DART Center will be launching a documentary filmmakers program, which I'm sure will contribute very positively to the great work that's already being done on so many fronts. The DART Center exists because traumatic events, whether writ small or large, from domestic violence to human trafficking to institutional abuse and to full-scale war, profoundly impact victims' lives, the journalists who report on these events, and the communities in which they occur. The reporting for which tonight's honorees, the Washington Post, Spotify, the New York Times, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and ProPublica are being acknowledged and celebrated. They address these impacts with great care, thoughtfulness, and thoroughness. And it is the result of the collaborative team efforts, and that's one of the things that I think is a real hallmark of the DART Awards, that these things happen. And these are teams that are comprised of reporters, photographers, producers, fact checkers, fact checkers, excuse me, mix engineers, composers, and the list goes on. So on behalf of all of the people who benefited from your storytelling and your craft, I thank you for setting such powerful examples of how to do it right and get it right. And I add my voice to the chorus of people singing your praises. Tonight's roundtable discussion, I'm very much looking forward to hearing more from the winners about the processes they employed and the obstacles they faced, and surely they did face obstacles during the course of their reporting. So in closing, I thank all of you for the very difficult work you do. It is important and it does matter. Technical moment. <laughs> Beautifully done. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and 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 thank you, Jim. As Jim mentioned, it is important as we hear more about the winners, to recognize that this is, always has been a team prize, and there's a reason for that. 
feeling of the Art Center has always been that telling stories about the most difficult human experiences, stories of cruelty and violence, of recovery and suffering, requires more than just great reporting. It really does require attention to images, attention to design, meticulous, careful editing. It's not just a, a kind of an accident that this is a team prize. Our view is that the extraordinary commitment that it takes to do trauma reporting is a newsroom-wide commitment. And that's why every year there is such a huge range of news organizations which win the DART Awards. This year we have local and national newsrooms across media platforms. Some years it has been very small local newspapers alongside some of the largest media organizations. It's because what counts is that collaborative effort to tell these extraordinary, extraordinary stories well. Um, we're now going to begin hearing a bit about each uh, honoree tonight. And I should say there's several categories of honorees. We're going to begin with a special citation. We'll hear about honorable mentions and two DART award winners. This is the last time I'm going to mention these categories. They are here because it's always an incredibly tough and difficult job, and all of these are some of the greatest works of journalism you will, you will ever hear. Um, we're going to do a brief video clip for each presentation, uh, and then uh, Jim, along with our good friend Jackie Doak, are going to um, present my, or I think, or is it just Jim, you and me? Not sure. Forget it. Three of them. No. Yeah. Four. Yes. We're going to present um, little plaques to the winners who deserve so much more than that. Um, and again, you're going to hear the disembodied voice of our good friend Sasha Pfeiffer um, introducing this. We're going to begin um, with something we've never done in quite this way before a special citation to the Washington Post for its ongoing coverage of gun violence in America, and in particular, the impact of gun violence on children. Uh, the Washington Post team will be represented here tonight by reporter John Woodrow Cox. The Washington Post received a special citation for its ongoing reporting on gun violence in the United States, specifically its impact on children. We are in a unique period of pervasive and escalating gun violence. So the jury recognized the sustained commitment of the Post and Enterprise reporter John Woodrow Cox for innovative, in-depth reporting on the impact of gun violence on children families, and communities. It's an issue that has become more urgent and more traumatic as our country becomes more soaked in guns and more politically divided. The general public feels considerable fatigue and helplessness about this, but the jury commended Cox for his unrelenting focus and his masterful ability to find new and illuminating angles on this issue. Jurors praised him for his deep sensitivity compassion, and unparalleled body of work that serves as a model for reporters and news organizations across the country. John, can you say a few words? dad brain. We have a 10-week-old back there. Um, you know, the, the, uh, this organization uh, has meant so much to me for so many years. I, I uh, was honored 
here in 2018 and uh, was really introduced to this place. And it has really, it's not just been a place that, um, you know, has celebrated some of my work. It's a place that's really shaped the work that I've done since, both in encouraging it to continue, but in teaching me on how to do it. Every year at the end of this, uh, you know, I've covered how children are impacted by gun violence for a long time. And at the end of every year, I think, well, that's it. I've, I've done everything that I can. I've said what I have to say. And, um, and then I just have kept going. And I'm saying again that I think I'm at the end, but I don't know. I might not be. Um, but, you know, as my wife said to me, uh, Jen, before I came up here, what the DART organization, the DART Center, has meant to us as a family and how well uh, you've taken care of us and supported this work and supported so much work that I admire. Um, because as has been said repeatedly tonight, you know, this is uh, people taking on really difficult subjects in the hope that um, we'll be out of a job one day. So I'm just enormously honored to be here and uh, that I got choked up seeing those children, uh, honestly. This is just a, an incredible honor. So thank you all for being here. Next, we're going to start with an honorable mention, which went to Gimlet, a Spotify studio represented by its host and managing editor, Connie Walker, uh, for Surviving St. Michael's, remarkable podcast. Last year, my brother Hal told me a story about our late dad. I'd never heard it before, and now I can't let it go. What was his mood when he was telling you that? No regrets, no remorse for what he had done. In the 1970s, my dad was a police officer in rural Saskatchewan. One night, while out on patrol, he saw a car swerving on the road and he pulled it over. When he walked up to the window, he recognized the man behind the wheel as being one of the priests that, and he said, one of the priests that abused him in residential school. And he ended up taking him out of the vehicle and, and beating the shit out of him. This story brought me home, home to a mystery in my own family that I need to solve. Did he tell you who the priest was or anything about him? No, he didn't, no. I've never heard him mention names, but I knew he had stories. I think I know who it is, but I, you know, I'm not going to say it on this thing. My search for answers has led me to the St. Michael's Indian Residential School. That first day I stepped into that residential school, my childhood was gone. Gimlet, a Spotify studio, received an honorable mention for episodes three and four of Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's. This podcast investigates how abuse at a government-funded residential school in Canada, run by the Catholic Church, scarred generations of Indigenous people. Those affected include the family of journalist Connie Walker. Judges called the work Last year, my brother Hal told me a story. That residential school, my childhood was gone. Gimlet, a Spotify studio, received an honorable mention for episodes three and four of Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's. This podcast investigates how abuse at a government-funded residential school in Canada, run by the Catholic Church, scarred generations of Indigenous people. Those affected include the family of journalist Connie Walker. Judge...
that was a great cliffhanger. I uh, applaud. And I can't wait to, I will, uh, can't wait to hear what, what the judges said, but it really is an honor to, to be here tonight. Um, this recognition is really incredible for me because of the time I've been able to spend here at the Dart Center um, as an Ockberg Fellow in 2019. Um, that was personally and professionally a transformative time for me. Uh, you know, I learned about how to be more trauma-informed in my reporting, how to help take care of, of myself and my team when doing this kind of work. Um, but I think what was unexpected for me uh, about that week was that I also learned about the power of storytelling to help heal from trauma. And that uh, was a revelation that uh, is really foundational to the work that's being recognized here tonight. Because although it uh, was a rigorously reported investigation into uh, the widespread abuse at a single residential school in Canada, it was also a personal story for me, a story about my father, about his abuse at that school, about my family and the reverberations of that abuse through generations. And along like with my team, I just feel so grateful that we were supported to help tell this story and that personally, I was supported to help feel the power of healing through the, being able to tell our own story. Uh, so I just wanna thank the DART Center for this incredible work that you all do um, every day for the work that you're doing to support journalists and to help empower us uh, to do this, this difficult but really important work. So thank you so much for, for this, I appreciate it. Next honorable mention uh, goes to the New York Times team, represented by uh, Meg Schutzer and Rachel Mueller, uh, for Dying Inside, Chaos and Cruelty in Louisiana Juvenile Detention. It's hard to make sense of what happened at the Ware Youth Center last month. Two teens being held at the detention center hang themselves to death within 72 hours back in February. Jordan Bachman was 17 years old and Solon Peterson had just turned 13. My kid didn't deserve to die because he set a fire to a roll of toilet paper in a school. They need to close that facility down. They need to close it down. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong in this situation. The New York Times received an honorable mention for Dying Inside, Chaos and Cruelty in Louisiana Juvenile Detention. This investigation reveals repeated abuses, overlooked complaints, and a surge in suicide attempts at a Louisiana detention center with powerful political allies. Judges described it as an incredible, daring feat of investigative journalism that was layered and scaffolded perfectly to let you see the tragic evidence for yourself. They praised Megan Schutzer and Rachel Lauren Mueller for their devotion of time to sources their impeccable research, and their sensitive exploration. Uh, 
hello everybody. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm Rachel, up here with my colleague Meg. Um, and I just feel really honored to be around such in such incredible company. Um, I'm like pretty starstruck by a lot of faces in this room um, and also just feel very humble. Um, reporting on trauma feels particularly important to me and I, I know that we worked really hard in um, the ways that we navigated this. Um, so this award, award in particular feels um, impactful and I just wrote a few other things down. I'm feeling a little bit nervous. Um, with all of these stories, it's difficult to engage with them without feeling the magnitude of the grief and the trauma that our subjects and their families have endured. Uh, for our project, for three years, we stood beside them and invest, invested in their past experiences, but also in their futures. Um, we know that trauma has no off switch. Uh, but what we hope is that throughout the process of our work, we're able to offer some sense of peace and healing while also bringing really important stories into the world. The existence of this award itself is an important acknowledgement of the significance and the weight that this kind of difficult work carries. Um, to be honored here today by the DART Center is just beyond anything we expected and means the world to us. Um, a few thanks to the investigative reporting program at UC Berkeley for seeing the potential in this story right from the very beginning. The New York Times, who trusted some very green journalists um, on a really challenging story. Our friends and family who supported us when we ourselves were really struggling at different points. And of course, for all those who shared little pieces of their lives with us to get this told, we're so grateful. Um, thank you all. Okay, uh, next we're going to hear a bit about our first DART Award winner of the evening, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and ProPublica uh, for The Landlord and the Tenant, represented by reporters Raquel Rutledge and Ken Armstrong. And if, if the video stops, we'll just move along. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and ProPublica received the Dart Award for The Landlord and the Tenant. This story uses side-by-side -side portraiture to highlight the criminal justice system's indefensible preconceptions and the life-altering failures of the social safety net. Judges described the piece as Dickensian in its depth, range, and storytelling power. They called it a gripping account of how two people are treated so vastly differently by the law. They commended the reporting team for offering a comprehensive, complex, nuanced tale that integrates intergenerational trauma, longitudinal systemic failures, and best intentions gone awry. Judges said the brilliance of the piece is in the details. They call the level of reporting required incredibly difficult and the writing both dispassionate and uniquely powerful. They praised Raquel Rutledge and Ken Armstrong for providing a master class in not only urban reporting, but systemic reporting around trauma and injustice. I'm Ken. Uh, this is Raquel. Um, thank you, Bruce, and our, our thanks to the DART Center for all you do to lift up journalism and to help us do our jobs better. 
Um, I, whenever I've had questions about trauma, uh, the first place I've turned to has always been the DART Center. And it's been that way for years, uh, many, many years. I can't remember the first time I called it Bruce and asked for help, but it was a long time ago. Um, credit um, for this award really goes to the work that Raquel did in, in this case. Um, the way in which she approached Angelica Belen, the, the tenant in our story, and then the way she communicated with her throughout, it was just a model of care, of being open-hearted and of wishing to understand rather than wanting to judge. Um, credit, too, uh, goes to our editors. Um, too many to name. There are always too many editors to name. Um, but they were open-minded. And they let us do this story, and they let us do it in the way that we felt would do it the greatest justice. Uh, I'm really grateful that we got a chance to go back and revisit Angelica Belen's life and to tell a fuller, more complicated story. And I'm really thankful that Raquel invited me to take part in telling it. So thank you. Next, we're going to recognize our final award winner of the evening, uh, the Boston Globe for Kate Price Remembers Something Terrible, represented by reporter Janelle Nanos and video producer and editor An Andrea Patino Contreras. My very first memory is of my father abusing me in the back of his mother's boyfriend's bar. I remember feeling shattered after my world had just changed and something major had just happened and everybody was acting like nothing had happened. My father trafficked me, sexually abused, physically abused me, that my grandfather abused, my mother looked the other way. These are very serious allegations. The Boston Globe received the Dart Award for Kate Price Remembers Something Terrible. It tells the story of an authority on child sex trafficking who spent decades trying to understand whether the unthinkable happened to her, too. Judges describe the piece as remarkable, revelatory journalism that addresses the complicated nature of memory with great depth, care, and wisdom. They noted how both journalist Janelle Nenos and survivor Kate Price are in pursuit of the same end goal, truth. Jurors called it an immensely empathetic, unflinching, and intelligent piece of journalism. They also praised the beautiful video and other multimedia elements, as well as the paper's dedication to the verification process. And they praised Nanos for her enormous commitment of time, of effort, of passion, and for achieving a level of reporting, commitment, and depth that transcended drama and pathos in real tragedy. Um, thank you so much to everyone uh, affiliated with the DART Center, everyone who's spoken tonight. Um, I am overwhelmed to be here. Um, I never thought that when I met Kate Price um, in 2012 that I would be standing here tonight, certainly. Um, I never thought I would spend 10 years on a story. Um, but Kate always knew. 
I was, in her words, her person. And she trusted me to bear witness to her trauma and her search for answers. Um, and when I met her sister, Carrie, she immediately did the same. I remain in awe of them both. Um, anyone in this industry knows what a rare and enormous gift it is to be able to tell these stories. Um, I was fortunate in that I had an extraordinary team to help me tell it. Um, my editors on this project, Scott Allen, Francis Storrs, were geniuses. Um, Aaron Clark, our, who made the gorgeous photos. Um, Andrea, who just made the documentary um, so brilliant. Um, John Hancock, who built a world of its own on the web, and Amy Padula, who knew all the reporting was in the tape and brought it to life. Um, my friends and my amazing husband, who have been with me for this 10-year journey. Um, the Globe's editor, who knew the risks that we took to tell this story and who believed in it um, and who made it happen. Um, and it's that belief in this story and in me that really is what the whole story is ultimately about. It is the power of being believed. So thank you to the DART Center for this extraordinary honor. Um, this means a tremendous amount to me to be recognized here for, um, considering the work that you do. So thank you. applause for all of our winners tonight. We're going to take a very short break, just a couple minutes, while those who are panelists tonight migrate up to the front of the room. If you need to grab some more nourishment, please do so. And we're going to transition from here into the heart of this evening, which is a conversation about how these remarkable stories came to be. See you in three minutes.
All right, speak, speakers, let's assemble. Before we lose the whole crowd. <laughs> I know you all know your own names. Find your places. <laughs> Congratulations. 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 Incredible. I just want to give everyone a hug. I know, yeah. Yeah. Hugs and hugs. This is so amazing. <laughs> I actually didn't see where my name was. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, good. Yeah. There's not some magic order to these names. Oh my gosh. No, that's no, that's great. So good. It's so intense. It's so intense. Oh, it's just uh, it's too much. I was excited to say all the things. And uh, there's Dave. Yeah. Um, <laughs> since publishing, like, have you done? How have you been taking care of yourself? A lighter yeah, story. I know. I write. I haven't. I well, I've gone into editing, but okay. I've okay. changed. It. Yes, I would love some more. Uh, probably, oh, it's on the booklet here. I do not demand yeah. such service. No, but you'll accept it. I will accept it. Times I've seen the uh, memes we've done this yeah, right here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. A lot of hardware. So it's so. Uh, I'm gonna have to pull myself together. I was just saying these stories are just traumatic, and they're, like they're they are, but they're they're yeah. also all all of your work is so profound. I mean, it really is. Every year the stories get deeper and deeper. Yeah, I and care, deeper. but people are not ready yet. I wonder. If it's it's so yeah. so amazing. It is. Which is why I just walked up there thinking, no, just I getting mean, entirely I'm that I had to say anything. Pants. That's yeah. exciting. <laughs> yeah. um, Narrowly. What's your baby's name? Lee. All right, folks, if you could uh, find your way back to your seats. Okay, how's it going? Those of you who are still well. eating and lubricating should continue to do so, but yeah. we do want to begin stuff, so. the conversation. Um, this is a really special opportunity to hear a little more about how such extraordinary journalism comes to be. Um, what we'll do is I, I'll ask a, a few, couple of rounds of questions of everyone, um, and then we'll go to the mics, and the, the mic, and um, I invite any of you who are here, and especially those of you who are students in this school, to come up and ask questions about how these stories came to be, and I would just, in advance say as you think about that, think about your questions as questions, not statements. Remember that there are probably going to be a bunch of people who want to ask stuff and we want to give them all an opportunity to do so. Um, so first, could we get one more round of applause for all the winners who are up here and in the audience. Um, also before the evening gets too long, I want to thank the DART Center team. Um, Ariel Richen, who put the videos together and mostly made them work. Um, uh, uh, Kate Black, Crystal Grow, who is out with COVID and not here. Zan Strumfeld, Alana Newman, who are all here. Thank you all for making this possible. Um, there's one common thread beyond the general notion of trauma in all of this year's winners. It is coincidental and yet also profound, which is that in one way or another, each of these stories, each of the stories we're recognizing tonight and that we've just heard about, are centered in very powerful ways on children, on the experiences of children with violence, sometimes to the cost of their lives, sometimes extending in haunted memory into adulthood, sometimes extending across generations, sometimes radiating out into the lives of communities. 
all your, our, and, and this really was not something the judges or we planned. It's the way the cards fell. And yet it does say something, I think, about the time we're in. Uh, something as well about the challenges that reporters face and the urgent need to find ways to, to talk about the worst things that happen to children and to interrogate children themselves, to interrogate memories of childhood, to th think about how to put that into journalism, which is not something that most of us as reporters ever gave much attention to, right? So I, I want to start out by asking each of you one thing, which is that as you think back on your work on your various stories, or in John's case, your whole kind of body of work, is there one way that you're, or a, one principal way in which you're reporting on childhood you're, or you're thinking about childhood as a zone for reporting or a place to begin reporting has changed. What would you like other journalists to know about the challenges of telling stories that involve young children? Um, and I think, um, Raquel, Megan, maybe I'll start with you. Both of you too. Gosh, I mean, to talk about how it's changed. I mean, I think this. Or how, do, or how did the story change you when you were thinking about where kids and news fit in and how you report? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a difficult question. Our story um, really revolved around a young mom with the three children who burned in the fire, and um, and I, I mean, the reason that I was so compelled actually it was photography that brought me into that story. Do you remember the picture, the last picture on that video of, her, of Angelica Blaine in the courtroom and just the look on her face? That was in 2013. So talking about 10 years mm -hmm. later, like you, you spent 10 years, I thought about that picture for 10 years and what happened in that fire. Um, and so I always wanted to go back to it. It was something I knew I wanted to do. Um, but, but I guess in terms of like covering children, I mean, that's... Ah, well, I, well it struck me also that you cast back into her childhood as well, and the way in which these kind of different generations of childhood found their way into your story. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that was so important, and this is where I called on Ken to help me, because I knew um, this was not a conventional investigation. I've been doing investigations for a long time, and this was something different, very different, and I wanted to tell it in a different way, and I knew that he was the one person on the planet that could help me figure out how to do this, like how are we going to tell this, and so it was brilliant on his part because I wanted to tell that story, I wanted to start that story initially with the scene of Angelica Belen locking her children in the room. I mean, because to me that was the most compelling thing. It's like she's preparing for her day, she's getting ready to go to work, and here's what she did. She hugged the kids and she said, I'm gonna be back and we're gonna have spaghetti for dinner. And it was so gripping. And I wanted to tell that. Like I thought that would be a good intro. And Ken, in his brilliance, he's like, no, no, no. We need to like understand her first. We need to know her childhood. We need to know where she's been. Speaking of her childhood, like how important that was in that decision making to leaving those kids alone. She had been left alone in her life and to her nothing happened. I mean, she was left alone many, many times and those were some of the best times of her life because she had been so abused. And so understanding how she got there I think was so important for the reader. To, so I just thank you to Ken for helping structure that way. Mm -hmm. Megan, kids in detention, mm -hmm. uh, not an easy subject. First of all, there are layers and layers and layers of uh, confidentiality around juvenile courts and juvenile offenders and all kinds of things. Secondly, there are enormous social prejudices. I mean, I remember when I was doing a, a lot of criminal justice reporting, it, the language at that point around juvenile offenders were super predators and a generational wolf pack. And I think lots of folks still make a lot presumptions about who's in juvenile lockup. Um, you're telling a different story and you have to build not only report that out, but then build a bridge to a, a readership that may not see things your way, 
talk about that, how you thought about kids and where, how the story maybe changed yeah. your work. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, reporting on um, young people in juvenile detention, it's really difficult to get access and for several reasons in terms of confidentiality being be one of them. But I think for us, when we found out that these two boys died in this detention center over the course of one weekend, it was just one of those moments where you know you need to understand what could have happened in this place to allow that to happen. And um, at first, what we did was try to find access to people um, who had been there before, because again, it's really hard to talk to people who were um, in this facility at the time. Um, and I think for us, we came in um, with an open mind, ready to listen to the full story that um, these young people and mostly young women wanted to share with us. We, it took a long time before we built their trust. Um, and then to go from there to think about the trust of anyone reading this article, I think um, it became just this cumulative process of, I mean, the echoes of what we were hearing from so many young people who had experienced the same kinds of abuse in this facility, I think, um, was part of how we had to then translate just one story to a broader audience. Um, how, how, how did you go about building trust with kids who've been so abused and betrayed by everybody in the system? It's hard enough to build trust with teenagers under the best circumstances or younger children under the best of circumstances. How did you go about that? I think um, one of the things that was um, really upsetting and distressing was that um, many of the people that we talked to had never spoken about what had happened to them at this facility, not even to family members. And so, no, we didn't just come in and immediately start asking them really hard questions, but we did find that after time and after um, building relationships with people that um, they're talking about this sometimes for the first time was something that they really wanted to do that was um, again, this processing of trauma that they were going through, that we were going through next to them um, in many of these cases. And we interviewed, I think, over 40 young people that um, had experienced sexual abuse or physical abuse at this facility. So it was so many people, and most of those had never talked about it before. So I think, yes, there was the trust building, and then there was almost this sense of relief of someone believes me and it wants to hear from me. Um, and that was actually one of the, the most surprising parts of it. I was gonna. I was gonna poke at that one one more time because so many of I, I find many of our students here at Columbia Journalism School as they begin reporting are anxious about talking to young people or anybody else about such severe trauma, fear of re-traumatizing, fear of provoking. Um, the worst emotions that people have um, and destabilizing people further. What kind of practices did you follow um, to minimize harm and maximize help to these kids? Sure, absolutely. I think from the beginning, um, we tried to have as much transparency as we could with where this was going. We were graduate students at uh, J School across the across the country, and um, so we didn't know that this would be in the New York Times, but we started with trying to share, this is who we are, this is what we're trying to do, and um, explaining our efforts really just to understand this facility as a whole. Often, um, we spoke to young people trying to understand, what was your schedule like at this place? What were, you know, when did you have meals? Where did, where did you stay? Kind of trying to understand the bigger picture and not asking people to go deep into their personal stories unless that was something that they wanted to and felt comfortable with. So I think it was a very tentative, um, very tentative and slow process of talking about many things before getting into people's personal stories and then again moving very slowly into the personal. Um, we were also working on a documentary and so there was this balance between what do we feel comfortable talking about um, just face to face and then well, you know, do you want there to be a camera in the room which changes everything? And so I think the relationship building and the, the slowness and the trepidation, I think, was part of it. And then also um, doing our best to connect the young people that we interviewed with the resources that we were familiar with in Louisiana and trying to find ways that um, whether or not they wanted to share anything with us that they knew as much as we knew of where they could go um, for support. What I should say for those of you who are not living within the world of journalism all the time, one of the most exciting developments and innovations in journalism in the last decade have been collaborations between 
journalism schools like Berkeley, like Columbia, like others, and investigative centers, major news organizations like the New York Times. It's been a powerful way, both of it, extending the experience and energy of students and adding to uh, adding force to often understaffed and depleted newsrooms. It's resulted in some extraordinary work. I just want to say one more thing. I think to your question, though, we were honestly terrified that we were creating that harm. And we were <laughs> going to the DART Center. We were going to our professors. And I think we still worry about that. And so I, I tried to answer your question with, like, our best practices. But the reality is I think that was a huge concern throughout and continues to be as, like, a story comes out into the world and someone who had buried something for a long time has to deal with the consequences of that. Yeah. Um, Janelle, you... You explored childhood through the long lens of memory, right? At one point, you, I think, described Kate Price as, as the archaeologist of her own memory, right? So you're, you're looking back at how childhood is remembered, how childhood abuse and exploitation and trafficking are remembered. Um, what did you come away with in thinking about how to report on that? Um, just how extraordinary our brains are at protecting ourselves. Um, I think when it comes to childhood trauma, um, particularly childhood trauma that falls into the category of betrayal trauma, where the person who is supposed to be your caregiver is the one harming you most, and you need to have a relationship with them in order to survive, and yet that relationship is destroying you in the process. Um, what the brain does uh, in terms of your capacity to survive that and then to block that. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of victims of severe childhood sexual abuse dissociate and have dissociative disorders. And it's only really into their 20s or 30s that they can fully kind of get to a place where they understand the abuse that happened to them. And that was Kate's story. Um, and so it's in part because you're a child and you don't know that the thing that's happening to you is wrong until you're an adult and you realize it. It's also because some of the worst things um, go into the recesses of your memory. And so for Kate, when those memories revealed themselves again and, the, and she relived through that trauma and then had these pieces of her life that she wanted to fit back together, um, it's layers. It's the childhood you thought you had, and then it's a childhood that's revealed to you. And so telling that story means revealing both to the reader, but also explaining that complexity and having to say, this is how memory works. This is how trauma works in the brain. Like, there's, all, there's a lot of layers here. Yeah. Um, and so I think for the sake of the reader, I was always kind of trying to anticipate where they were thinking, where their questions were arising. How could she possibly remember something from when she was three? How could she possibly forget? Yeah. And so being able to explain that complexity, I think, was really at the heart of the story. Yeah. I mean, we may talk more about that in a few minutes. It's a really unusual way that this story is structured. Um, you know, Connie, when you and I first met a few years ago, you had been reporting a lot on First Nations children and women and on, on victimization. But here you've gone at it, A, in even greater depth, and B, done it through the lens of your own family. What did you think you understood going into this project that you've come out the other side thinking about differently or reporting on differently or that you'll carry differently to the next project? I think that, that like in terms of like understanding the impacts of residential schools in Canada was something that as a reporter um, in Canada for for you know tw 20 years I thought I I thought I understood um, quite a lot but it really was hearing that story about my dad and about the fact that he had been abused at a residential school that that really was surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, like one of the first times I thought about like how this had impacted me and my family and my father, and and um, and I think that 
was the the kind of spark that then made me actually what what I learned through like my time at the Dart Center and then the work I did after that in in like trauma specific therapy was was like the power in shining a light the power in exposing it that that so much time and energy is is spent of trying to avoid something that is absolutely unavoidable and that I I had learned like that it was actually a relief to talk about it a relief to shine a light to learn more and so I, I I wanted that approach with with this story as well and I think what I came away with was was something I never could have imagined in terms of like what we were able to uncover about the scale of abuse at a single school the number of people like that we spoke to uh, survivors of this residential school but then the number of um allegations we were able to uncover through lawsuits and court documents was just staggering and something I think I'm still processing honestly because what came with it was then hearing from the people who are now still being affected because those children who were abused at that residential school went home and this cycle continued and continued and continues today and so I feel like that is something that 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 I think, you know, we've had a truth and reconciliation process in Canada, but I think we're still really at the beginning stages of understanding the truth. Mm -hmm. John, uh, I, I should say, John Woodrow Cox has already very generously done a ton of tip sheets and videos and other things for the Dart Center, talking about his strategies for interviewing children and reporting on children. So I'm not gonna ask you to regurgitate those. Um, but one thing that struck me looking at the body of your work for which the judges awarded you the special citation at this time of, of overwhelming gun violence in our country is that on the one hand you do describe the huge vulnerability and damage to children's lives including those at a very young age who most of us as reporters wouldn't even begin to think about reporting on you you do that but you also you're not only portraying pathology, you're not portraying a doomed generation. You are also portraying a lot of resilience, to use a perhaps hackneyed at this point word. You're showing children as full human beings who cope. How did you, how did you do that? What are, how, you know, how, as a, as a storytelling matter, it's very difficult, even with adults, mm -hmm. to describe contradictory and complex outcomes or to avoid turning people either into trauma cliches or hallmark hall of fame closure cliches how, how do you approach that and how do you think and i should say how do you think about where trauma and resilience in children fit together now you know i, I think um Time is the most important tool that we have, right, as reporters. And uh, this is a message for editors and news organizations. <laughs> There's I mean, few that, in the room. To portray someone uh, in full, it takes time. And, uh, you know, I think about, I basically lived in Uvalde for last summer. And, um, you know, the, the little girl, Caitlin Gonzalez, who was the center of that story is a, a great example of many things. And that in particular, you know, I was there um, the first time I met her. She, um, it was just to sort of get to know me. I just wanted to make her comfortable. And, and she insisted on telling me the story of that day. And we were, I was there for three hours. And then at the end of that, she said, uh, I'm going to take you to the cemetery because uh, she wanted to give me a, a tour of, um, of her friends. So I was there for that. But then I was also there when she, you know, it started raining and, um, and incredibly, that's like the hottest place I've ever been. Uh, and uh, it started raining. She wanted to go do cartwheels, you know, in the rain. And uh, then I was also there when she's sitting on the couch and just starts watching videos of uh, other survivors of school shootings and, and knows every detail of every kid um, because she's watched them over and over and over again, right? But all of those were the result of just being there. And then 
And then being willing, I think there can be a tendency, especially maybe early in your career, to sort of lean into the horror, right? And lean into, oh, here's the, let me, let me surface the trauma, right? When in fact, uh, it doesn't, that's not real. And it won't read real to um, a reader. Because a 10-year-old is still a 10-year-old, right? She's still at the end of, you know, giving this incredible speech. Like really all she wants is to go get a couple of stuffed animals and then go get, um, you know, a snow cone, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, you know, I think that it's that sort of simple of, of reporting and reporting and reporting and reporting and then uh, realizing that, um, you know, the, the weight of someone's trauma and the, del the way you deliver to the reader uh, is made much more powerful if you've delivered a person in full. And, you know, uh, almost every kid um, – who I've written about through the years, has that part of them, right? And I see hope. There hasn't been a child that I haven't seen hope in, uh, not one. And, you know, I, I think about, the, you know, when I was here last time in 2017, I'd written about a little girl in uh, Townville, South Carolina, who was the most damaged person that I'd ever, ever written about. She didn't go to school for six years. She went back to school last year. And so I got to go back and mm -hmm. tell this story about her. And she had a little crush on a boy. And she was doing great. She was making A's, right? And so this was, to me, it was like uh, if, if anyone sort of could have felt hopeless, it was that family. And um, here she was. Yeah. I'm going to ask one more quick round of questions, and then we'll go to the room. So you may want to line up at the mic and be thinking about what you want to ask. Um, Janelle, I think I'm going to ask start, uh, start with you on, on this one. In talking to... Kate Price, as you were saying a few minutes ago, you, you do this kind of interesting balancing act between believing, trusting in memory, but also situating it, having to challenge it, and situating it within trauma science and neuroscience and other fields that sometimes have cast a very skeptical eye on recovered memory and on fragmentary memory and the reliability of long past trauma memory. How did you, um, A, what made you go in that direction in the first place? Because there's, there's actually a lot of science. B, how, I presume you don't have a degree in neuroscience, so how did you educate <laughs> yourself? How did you educate yourself to the point where you were comfortable doing this, deciding who to listen to, and so on? Yeah. And in a writing way, how did you balance it? That, that's a lot. Give a relatively Good quick question. answer, but it's like. Um, so, I, yeah, I, d I don't have a, I'm not a neuroscientist, which, you know, um, that might be my next career path, but uh, no. Um, but, I, but there are a lot of them in Boston. <laughs> uh, and there are a lot of people, tr Boston, so I'm, uh, somebody told me the other day that um, that Boston to trauma is like Vienna was to the Romantics. Like yeah. Boston has this just nexus of trauma specialists. Um, one of them is Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score and was Kate's therapist. And um, and so I talked to Bessel. Um, you know, uh, there were people who were willing to help me tell the story because they'd watched the memory wars unfold during the 90s when victims came forward about their abuse and were just pushed aside and told those are not true. Um, and they wanted to write that story, like mm. correct that story, not write it, I was the one writing it, but um, they wanted that truth out there that this, that this can happen. And so, but again, like I had to report it, but then I had to also tell my editors, right? And so, I will say, like, there's a um, there's a wonderful um, therapist in in Boston who, Jim Hopper, who's an expert in in traumatic memory, who got on a Zoom call with the Globe editor, my editor, our attorney, and talked through the process of this is how recovered memory works because we all wanted to make sure we got it right, mm -hmm. and there was a lot at stake. So um, for me, it was really such a tremendous part of Kate's story that I knew that it had to be a big part of the story itself, too. All right. Yeah, thanks. Raquel, you, you and Ken told this story, this story of two very different lives of Todd Brenner, the landlord, and Angelica, and her kids, and her own 
past. And what struck me in rereading it today is that in a way that's different from most of the investigative stories I see now, it's a small story. Um, that is to say, it's about two very particular people. Most investigative reporting that we see now are, are big system stories with huge agglomerations of data showing systemic discrimination and or systemic collapses and failures and, you know, uh, which is enormously important reporting and is the kind of stuff I did. But this is, this is a story of one slumlord, a story of one mother, one horrific tragedy, and where each one of these went into the legal system. How did you two come to see this as having epic reporting possibilities, as really being a pathway into something so far-reaching and important that says something about our society, yet does it without the usual uh, data sets and, you know, it's about the particulars. Yeah, I mean, that was our concern from the outset was the challenge of we didn't have a nut graph. And we, we knew our editors at ProPublica and the Journal Sentinel are heavy on the nut graph and what are the investigative findings and how's that going to go. But um, we were trusting our readers. I mean, we really thought that if we could tell these stories in this braided narrative way, that we trusted the readers to see where the systems were failing. We were showing. We were just using the facts, minimum, minimal facts, to just show what happened. And you could see the various systems that failed along the way. And so we really, it was a leap of faith. And, and we had the discussion with our editors. And um, they didn't, they didn't uh, bulk at that. And they just, they, they read it and um, could see it. So uh, we we've, were hopeful that readers would also uh, follow along and see it that way. Yeah. So it was deliberate. <laughs> to, to not have a nut graph. Yeah. 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 But it's unusual, yeah. right? And, yes. and lesson students here, not every story needs a nut graph. Don't say that to your professors, that, <laughs> you know, but, it's, but it's true. And actually, you know, Megan, that leads me to a question for you about mm -hmm. the writing of this story. It's very hard in United States and society at the moment to get people to pay attention to stories about prison it's even harder to get people to pay attention to stories about juvenile offenders, let alone the systemic exposures of abuse in a state that people also don't want to hear a lot about, Louisiana. How did you think about the writing of this? How did you think about writing and presenting, in its various multimedia ways too, a story that could draw readers into this very difficult institution that most people want to think about, very difficult offenses that people don't want to think about, and, and abusive children. How was the kind of the, how'd you think about that? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great question, and it, our story was really long, too, so it was like heavy and a very difficult topic and long. Um, and I think we, we knew that the individual stories we had heard were really powerful, and um, at the same time, we wanted, um, I think our sort of like, one of the things that was part of our inner compass throughout this was both like looking at these individual stories, but then also looking at the systems and really making sure that, not in a different way, but like making sure that we were weaving the two together. And so I think um, the way that we hope to get people into the actual storytelling that we thought was really powerful was just with the, the numbers and the sheer um, just astonishing numbers of children that were attempting to end their lives in this facility because that's just when you you see that many kids trying to find any way out even through suicide you know that something is wrong and then that numbers into the actual broader story so i'm not sure that um that that is like a deeply exciting um, <laughs> entry point, but I think it was really what we felt like was the most important sort of top thing that you needed to know about why you should pay attention to this place. Why you should pay attention to this. You don't always need a nut graph, but you do always need to make a case for why you should pay attention to this, right? Um, Connie, you did something that would daunt most of the most seasoned investigative reporters I know, which is to apply your investigative reporting skills to your own family. Mm. Um, you know, we 
sometimes in our classes here, even in newsrooms, we will have conversations about, well, who is entitled to report on their own community or their own identity group versus who's an outsider? I have actually find myself saying sometimes, no matter how much you identify with a community, try applying your own reporting skills to your own family and see where the lines get drawn. What was that like for you? What what went well and what was really challenging about reporting out a family story? I mean, it was really difficult. Like, um, I, I still am worried about it. <laughs> it's yeah. been out for a while, you know, just because um, because it's so deeply sensitive and because so many of the people in my family that we were talking to were survivors of this residential school, and, and that's part of what we were talking to them about. And these were, again, not conversations that we ever had before. But there was something about having a microphone that seemed to like give us permission to talk about it in a way that was that that was interesting and and I felt like even though they they were really difficult conversations often um they were also good conversations like I we felt good after they were also filled with laughter and like and and for me because of the my relationship with my father and the estrangement like it was a chance to reconnect, which I think was was I'm, I'm so grateful for. But I, I think that that um, the other like just from a, a, a journalism point of view, like it, because I was so close to it, I, I really had a lot of difficulty um, editorially, like understanding. I was like, like after the first reporting trip, I remember coming back and um, you know I had done these interviews with my family members. And I was like, to the team, I was like, I was like, I'm really into this like two hour interview with my Auntie Margaret, but like, do you guys like, is this, <laughs> is this a story? Like, is this a thing, you know? And and I really had no gauge, you know? And I think that the, the, the really the only way that it was possible to do this, this work was because we had such an incredible team mm -hmm. and because I had so much editorial support to do that. And that's something that's a privilege in this day and age in journalism um, and something that, you know, I, I, I'm just so grateful for. Were, were, was there ever a time when you felt an impulse to self-censor because it was a family story where your team had to talk you into continuing on? No, I don't, I don't feel like, I feel like part of the thing was around the agency that I was like leading, leading where I was comfortable going, which was, I think, so important in terms of like having it be a positive experience. Um, I think that there, there was like, there was always a question in my mind whether or not I was going to reveal my own um, childhood sexual abuse by a survivor in my family. Um, and it really was, I think, like because again of the support that I had in the team, but also the agency I had to to feel like I was in control of whether or not I was going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. That that was, was something that was a question throughout, uh, for sure. John, you you know you've said several times, as you said tonight, that you think you're probably stepping back from gun violence reporting for a while, or at least gun violence and kids for a while. We'll see. But that leads me, gives me a wonderful opportunity to exploit you and say, since you are allegedly stepping back, um, what do you think is the most, what do you now think of as the most underreported terrain? What do you wish other reporters would pick up where you've left off or just where it needs to go? What's one direction the story hasn't gone that it needs to go, or what's one area where the story of the impact of gun violence could do, go deeper to have bigger impact? If, if you were now somebody's editor and saying, going out and do it. Uh, that, that list is long. I, I uh, you know, the, sort of the broadest answer, um, and I've preached, I preached this for years, and I still think I, there isn't enough of it, is telling stories through the eyes of children. Um, you know, in some ways, I've always viewed uh, writing about gun violence through kids' eyes as a Trojan horse to get people to care about gun violence at all. Because there is an age, and I've seen it literally in the metrics of the stories that I've written, where people, you can see when the victim blaming starts, you know, when they look at someone and say, well, this was his fault that he got shot, he was in the wrong place, he was probably in a gang, right? You, you, can, you can see there's that moment. 
And you know, it's hard to bring, it's hard to uh, blame a four-year-old in um, yeah. Cleveland, Ohio, for getting shot in the head, right, in a road rage incident. Um, so, but I still see read so many stories that are about children and about gun violence affecting children, where the children are one-dimensional. Mm-hmm. They are not uh, deeply explored, and, and I think it's because there's a, often a reluctance among reporters to just go there, or maybe a distrust, or you know, what am I really going to get from um, this kid or, you know, and often it's that first conversation can be pretty flat. <laughs> it's not always that way, but often it can be. But, you know, I've always found with kids, you go back the second time and you're suddenly this familiar person in their life and uh, then they're ready to, to go. So, uh, you know, it's not, uh, that, that is an area that I still think, I mean, we write about school shootings all the time and who's quoted in those stories. I mean, it is almost always the teacher, yeah. the police officer who responded, the superintendent, and, uh, you know, the, sort of the, 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 the eye-opening moment for me around um, school shootings was going to a school shooting that no one remembered in South Carolina where one child died and finding hundreds of victims, children who were fundamentally changed by a shooting that lasted a matter of seconds. And they were all different. And it was like, God, as a country, we're just, we're blind to this. So... The scope of it still is something I don't think as journalists that we've really um, gotten a handle on. But I think that idea especially is let children, give children agency, let them tell their stories. Mm, thanks. Go for it. Be a good journalist. I'll be, I'll be the first. <laughs> um, just first of all, thank you all so much. Um, it's really brave work um, that you've all done. and. Um, I have a lot of questions, um, but I guess um, there's sort of a two-part question. It's, um, did you um, do anything to prepare your audience for um, what you were about to, to tell them about? Um, you know, these difficult subjects that, that people, you know, want to turn away from, was there any sort of editor's note or um, like how did you, or you know, even um, if people start to feel something, if they get triggered or they, you know, they they want to put it away or or not confront it, um, was there anything to do to, to um, help your audience yeah. with that? And then what was, kind of the response, and, and, I and guess. Yeah, no, that's a real question. I think there's a couple dimensions. One is, did any of you use content warnings? What was the conversation about that on your teams like? But how did you take care of your readers and listeners and viewers and downloaders? Um, there are lots of different ways of taking care of readers. So any thoughts on that? Anyone want to jump uh, in here, Connie? Yeah, sure. I, we did have a content warning at the beginning of every episode that, that this episode deals with um, um, sexual violence, uh, so that people were aware who, before listening. But but this remo- like that question made me think of episode four of our podcast, which is primarily just survivors' voices in their own words, remembering their experiences as children in this school. And it was very very difficult to produce because um, I feel like there's this tension between wanting to respect the truth that the survivors told us in terms of what they went through at the school as children versus like what can our listeners handle what can what can an audience listen to and that was something like i think that we all like as a team grappled with for a really long time because um because these are such difficult stories such difficult truths and we, you know, we felt a responsibility to the survivors to to accurately reflect their experiences, but also we wanted to make it something that people could listen to, and that was really, really hard. And I think I'd be interested in what how other people have grappled with that because I feel like this is this is something that probably everyone has dealt with. Any of the other think? Did you think about that question? How you take care of folks? Yeah, I mean, we did not have a content warning. Um, but what we did dial back some of the violence, some of the abuse, and there, there was, we had more details, um, but all of us had the same sense at some point that it was too much. Like the editors can both, uh, we, we all were like, we don't, we don't really need, like it, we've shown 
what we need to show. We don't need to, so we took some stuff out. But I think the other thing that we really wanted to leave readers with, which we thought was really important, was hope. And so in some of the final chapters, well, one of the second to last chapters in that story is Angelica Belen in prison today. And I mean, she is just a beacon of light. And it's crazy to me, she's been in prison for half of her, she was sentenced to 18 years, she's been in about 10 now. And um, you know, she said prison saved her life and she's been through a ton of therapy and she's in a good spot. She's helping other women in prison now. And so there is hope, I mean, so the hopefulness, I think was really important and, and we wanted to make sure that that was included. Yeah. Yeah. Great. John Barth, and we should say that John was one of this year's Dart Award judges, for better or worse. No, no, it's really terrific. Um, so I wanted to play off of that, Raquel, good good lead up. Um, what have you all learned about resilience? We hear about that a lot in trauma. What have you witnessed? What should we know about resilience? Yeah, I mean, well, so Angelica Blen is one of those women who, I, she's just a uh, huge inspiration. Her resilience is remarkable, and her sister as well. Both of them, her sister has five children and lives in um, Iowa, and I interviewed her at their home, and um, I mean, I just learned about abuse is super complex and not what we think it is, and not, I didn't know that much about it. I don't come from a family with abuse, and um, I had a lot of preconceived ideas about what I might be like if someone had done these things to me. And so Angelica Belen is still in touch with the foster family that like, you know, made her kneel on her knees overnight in the corner with hangers on her arms. I mean, she's still in touch with them. And for me, that was so hard to understand uh, how that is. Um, a super learning curve for me on, on what abuse is like. So uh, it was good. It just changes the way that I think about when I'm reporting and seeking the truth. It's like not always what I would do is, doesn't, is not how somebody else might act. And so um, uh, that kind of digresses from resilience. But um, those two women, those sisters, are, are uh, so resilient. It was, now, how did you, you know. come to think about this idea? Because you're dealing with someone who had enormous reserves of injury and enormous reserves of coping. And Yeah. Um, I think for, for Kate, uh, the resilience sort of came through this search that she want, She wanted these answers. And she's now an academic. She's a scientist. She the, her, her, the way she views the world is about compiling the facts, getting the data. Like, how do I, how do I get the pieces and make sense of it all? And so she, she took that same approach to her story. And I think there's an extraordinary resiliency in that, in finding that, like, the thing that drives you and applying that to your own trauma. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think one, one of the things I know I, as a journalist, have learned from my Dart Center colleagues uh, who are clinicians and other trauma experts is often the importance of the survivor mission, uh, the, the person who undertakes a particular kind of work or particular line of helping other survivors or even telling their own story. And I will just say, again, to those of you who are early in your careers here, that when you find that source who has a powerful survivor mission, you're lucky because that's someone who has found a way of coping that is about others and not just themselves, mm -hmm. and they're much more likely to cooperate with you. We have time, I think, for one more, so go for it. Hi, uh, I'm Eric, I'm a local freelance journalist. Uh, thank you for all your work. Um, I, like probably everyone here, has been following the coverage of the war in Israel and Gaza, and you know, there's obviously been so many horrific photos and videos and print stories already, and um, but I feel like people are already so dug into their views, and I feel like the longer this goes on and escalates, people, you know, there's a risk of people becoming numb to the stories, and so I wondered what ideas you have for ways to cut through that and to, um, yeah, I, just to cut through that as journalists. Quick thoughts on how your own work you've thought about cutting through numbness, John. Maybe that that's for you. Yeah, yeah I mean that's yeah. I mean that's a perpetual problem, right? When you're writing about gun violence, is is people there's so much to overcome <laughs> to get somebody to click on uh, one of those stories. And it, it sort of goes back to to my last uh, comment about. Um, 
depicting people in full. You know, I think we as humans want to read deeply human stories. We want to see other people in ourselves, and that has always been sort of my goal is, is if I'm telling a story from a part of um, Washington, D.C., you know, and if I'm in southeast D.C., I want people in northwest D.C. who've never driven across the river to see themselves as their own children in that kid. And again, it just re requires uh, a lot of reporting, but we've seen. I mean, I, I know that the stories that have resonated, it's when you can tell that deeply, deeply human story, that's true of every piece up here, right? That's why these pieces resonated is because uh, they weren't shallow. They went deep. Um, and I think that the best reporting, the most memorable reporting I can think of from the past week were stories that were not just about horror. It was somebody who you've told me who they were, then I care. I care about the consequences. I care about the loss. Uh, you know, you have to give people reason to care beyond just look at this awful thing. You have to make that person uh, uh, real. Yeah. Looks like we have two more questions. I'll tell you what, each of you quickly ask your question, both in succession. We'll pitch them to the panel and see how we end it. And then we need to let our wonderful <laughs> colleagues in the facilities department here do their jobs too. So go for it. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Patience Yange. I come from Kenya and I represent the Association of Media Women in Kenya. My question is to any of you who feels like they can answer this question. If you want, knowing what you know now, and of course, uh, based on the impact that your stories have had, if you were to do this story again afresh today, what else will you change in your stories? Mm. That's all right. So if you do your story again, but but something you might do differently. Yep. And quickly. Yes. Um, I'm curious what you all have uh, felt throughout this process, these, these particular stories about what you owe to your sources. I feel like there's a lot of journalism conventions about where boundaries are and those are there for good reason, but it feels like with these stories it's, it's different and, and how do you manage those relationships and take mm -hmm. care of people while also being professional? All right, so two really great questions. What's something you might do differently um, after these particular projects and beats? Um, and how do you think about relationships with sources? Who wants to take question one? Something you do differently. Anybody? Go. Yeah. I think one of the things that Rachel and I struggled with throughout this, um, this pro um, project that we did, it, it took us three years, and pretty quickly, I would say within the first year, we were starting to hear stories of abuse at this facility, and we grappled with, do we keep reporting and try to get this story into the biggest possible national outlet in hopes that people pay attention to it, or do we get this information out into the world as soon as possible? And I'm not saying that I wish we had done it differently, but I think if I were to pick a different path, we would have published something in year one and maybe not had it in the New York Times and maybe not have talked to as many people but gotten some of this information out more quickly. I think that's one of those ethical questions that I still grapple with is like, did we do, I mean, we did it as quickly as we possibly could, but was it fast enough? Well, and I would also say that sometimes there's tactical benefit to pushing a piece of a story out because it may shake other sources loose. So it's not always a zero sum choice, right? Um, and that other question, sources. Sources. Um, uh, you know, it's not every, you don't get to normally work with a source for 10 years uh, whose husband works with you at the Globe. Um, so that, that was unique. Um, and, and yet, um, Kate's familiarity with journalism, uh, her trust in my ability to report it out. Uh, somewhere back in 2013, 2014, we did a little panel discussion about our work, which I was like sitting there like, you know, I didn't have anything yet. There, was no, there wasn't really a story there. And she said, well, Janelle's going to go find out what she's going to find. And if she finds out things that are wrong, then that's, that's her job and that's not my job. And so it was this dual path that we had uh, in the story. But it also, you know, it over a 10-year process, you just start texting with someone and – I, I say it in the story, but, you know, she texted me once during dinner and said, we should really find this pedophile in prison by my house. In, you know, and I was like, I'm eating dinner. Like, you know, <laughs> if there's a there's a connection there where you're just, you know, I'm with my kids. Like it, the story took on a life of its own and the relationship did, too. And I think um, it's been interesting because once it's out there in the world, it becomes bigger. Like it, it was like our world, the two of us for so long. And uh, once it was out there, it's like, oh, there's other, we kind of both looked up and, and said, oh, like this is something bigger than us now. Yeah. yeah. 
All right. Um, can we thank all our panelists again? Um, this is. I, I want to point out that it's eight o'clock. It's half an hour after we said we were going to stop, and yet we have a full house who stayed, and it's because of the incredibly compelling work and the compelling speakers we have. Um, if you have not already, you should visit the Dart Center website, www.dartcenter.org, where you will find a massive library of tip sheets and backgrounders and resources for journalists and researchers and many others. You'll find every Dart award-winning story since 1994 and lessons learned from them and most of the event videos. You will also find a little button on the page that allows you, should you choose to, to donate to support the work of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. Um, thanks again to all of our winners for their work, for their contributions tonight. Keep doing it. See you all soon. Yeah, for sure.